you watch streaming TV today, you'll find many shows that focus on the super wealthy. These shows include Wizard of Lies, which depict the life of Bernie Madoff and his wife Ruth. Madoff ran one of the largest Ponzi schemes in history using the investments of new people to pay the returns for those expecting big payoffs. Billions, which delves into the life of David Axelrod, who created his financial empire by managing hedge funds. The show then details how U.S. Attorney, Attorney General Chuck Rhodes goes after the, the illegal operations of Axelrod. Downton Abbey features the luxurious lives of the Crawleys as they enjoy High Clear Castle while the downstairs servants look after their every whim and desire. It's reported that Queen Elizabeth loved to watch the show to spot historical inaccuracies such as the types of medals on an officer's uniform. Arrested Develop delves into the intrigues of an Orange County, California clan who use shady real estate and business deals to create their financial empire. Nashville chronicles the lives of various fictitious country music singers trying to break into the big time in country music to make big bucks and acquire fame. In Empire, a hip-hop mogul learns he is diagnosed with a fatal disease, so he must choose among his children who will run this major music dynasty in the future. Now, if you're old enough to remember the Beverly Hillbillies, it was a show that portrayed the Clampets, a clan of Ozark, Missouri hillbillies who suddenly become rich by oil found on their land. They then move to Southern California, where some of their traditional sensibilities clash with Jed Clampett's banker, Milburn Drysdale, and his assistant, Jane Hathaway. The actual truck from that series is in a museum on the campus of College of the Ozarks near Branson, Branson Missouri. Bonanza is another TV show that ran from 1959 to 1973. It portrayed the wealthy Western Cartwright family headed by Ben Cartwright. He was a widower with three sons, Adam, Eric, the big guy who was known as Hoss, and Little Joe. They lived on a thousand square mile ranch called the Ponderosa. In each of these popular TV series, viewers enjoy peering into the lives of the rich and how they dealt with various kinds of challenges from both within the family and without often taking for granted the wealth they controlled. The next two weeks we're going to look at what Jesus had to say about dealing with our money and possessions. Today we will begin by looking into the parable of the rich young ruler. Although Luke's version doesn't identify the main character as young, that detail is provided in Matthew's parallel account. Mark's account also adds that the ruler came running to Jesus and kneeled down before him. I'm reading from Luke 18, beginning at verse 18. A ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. I've kept all these from my youth, he said. When Jesus heard this, he told him, You still lack one thing. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. After he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. Let's pray now. Father, as we look at this story, the rich young ruler, we know that... Uh, we too have to be careful that we use our possessions, our, the money that we have and the financing that uh, we use it for good causes and not only on ourselves. Lord, help us to understand the principles that we need to acquire from this story and how we can put them effect into our own lives. Help us to understand your purpose uh, in this story today. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Luke records that a ruler comes before Jesus with an important question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We can only guess what kind of ruler this man was. It is probable that he was either a member of the Sanhedrin, which was a ruling Jewish body of, made up of 71 members, or else an official in a local synagogue. He addressed Jesus as good teacher, 
which was only a slight acknowledgement that Jesus was of a special category. But the ruler didn't consider him as other than someone with some interesting ideas about relating to Jehovah God. Jesus responds in verse 19 in a way that has puzzled scholars over the years. He said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Some have tried to pin Jesus down as admitting he was a man who was capable of sinning. But that doesn't seem to fit the situation here. Possibly Jesus was acknowledging that he understood that the rich young ruler didn't recognize him for who he claimed to be, God himself in human flesh. And if he was God in the flesh, he was incapable of sinning. However, Jesus didn't want to debate that particular issue with this man. He saw something deeper in the rich young ruler's question. After all, his inquiry was the ultimate question. What must one do to obtain eternal life? That is the point that Jesus wanted to focus on with this man. In verse 20, Jesus acknowledges that any good Jewish man should adhere to the laws that God has established. And here he mentions five of the Ten Commandments handed down to Moses by God. These commandments all had to do with how a God follower should live and respond in respect to one's neighbor. The five commandments that he did not mention by name all had to do with how one should relate to God. The ruler responds in verse 21 with an affirmative answer. I've kept all these from my youth. A Jewish young man, once he has his bar mitzvah, which recognizes him as capable of making his own religious decisions, is supposed to observe all the laws that God has established for his people. He indicated that he had kept all the laws that Jesus mentioned ever since he had become a faithful Jewish believer. Jesus was perceptive about the hearts of men. He may have recognized that this man who was in the ranks of local Jewish leadership must have been known for his faithfulness to the laws of God. But Jesus knew that there was one area of his life where he lacked total commitment, the area of his personal possessions. And that is what Jesus challenged the man to do. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor. Can you imagine if you were confronted about the same thing with the Lord? Sell everything you have and give it to the poor? How would that make you feel? I dare say that all of us would take issue with this order from the Lord. You don't expect me to give up everything, do you, Lord? You know I need something to live on. Why are you requiring this extra step for me? Jesus has a way of knowing our biggest issues in life. But he often challenges us to give up everything we hold dear for his sake. Earlier in Luke, we saw how Jesus challenged those who would dare to follow him with total obedience. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector called Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. For Levi, or Matthew as he was also known, Leaving his responsibility as a tax collector meant he no longer had a way to make a living. Then later in Luke, we saw the same principle illustrated. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Does this same idea still hold for all of us who desire to be a disciple of Christ? That we must give up everything we have to the poor? In other words, is this a universal requirement of true discipleship? Some have argued that very principle in the past. They've advocated living in Christian community where no one holds ownership of anything. All one's worldly goods are owned by everyone and can be used by everyone. But this does not seem to be a universal command for every follower of Christ. Sometimes Jesus does demand that we put everything on the altar, including our children, our lives, our possessions. Anyone who faces a call to Christian ministry realizes that when they do so, they put on hold everything else that they might want to do with their lives. I know that was something we had to consider when we followed the Lord's command to spend years in a foreign country sharing the gospel as missionaries. In the final verse we are considering today, we see that the rich young ruler reacted with sadness to the Lord's command to him to sell everything he had to give to the poor. Luke indicates that the man was very rich, and that if he were to radically follow Jesus as his Lord, he would have to give up the comfort of all his possessions. And that 
was a road too far for him, so he went away crestfallen. He couldn't meet such a high standard just to follow some itinerant preacher. As we consider the implications that this parable of the rich young ruler has for us, we recognize that we too may have to make some hard choices in order to follow Jesus as our Lord and Master. I want us to consider a couple of principles based on this first edition of Dealing with Wealth. First, obey God's laws as a hallmark of your life. What do I mean when I say that we should obey God's law as a hallmark of one's life? The word hallmark, hallmark has two accepted meanings. The first meaning is that a hallmark is an official mark or stamp indicating a standard of purity or often used in making gold and silver articles. The second and more common way of thinking of a hallmark is a typical characteristic or feature of a person or thing. An example we cite is that an independent press is considered one of the hallmarks of a free society. So when I suggest that we obey God's law as a hard hallmark of your life, I mean that first we know what God's laws are because of our familiarity with them. Are these laws the Ten Commandments then? Yes, but I think they are much more than that. They're anything that we find in God's Word that helps us know how we should live our lives and how we should treat other people. It is the do unto others as you would have them do unto you kind of thing. Jesus recognized that the rich young ruler probably had kept God's laws faithfully throughout his life, but he had a blind spot caused by his great wealth. We too, based on our, most of our income and possessions, would be considered wealthy in comparison to the way that the rest of the world lives. So we too must recognize that our wealth may be a hindrance to following Christ with the passion we need to follow him. The second principle is give generously of your wealth to those who are poor. While scholars generally agree that the idea of selling one's wealth and giving it all to the poor is not a universal law for every believer, still we must consider ways that we can give of our rich resources to those who have little or nothing. There are many ways that we can help distribute our wealth to the poor. We can give canned goods and shelf-stable items to food pantries or blessing boxes. We can support nonprofit organizations in our community that help people in great need. You can do this by giving of your time or money, just as we do through our support of Love, Inc. Adopt a child by providing some money through various ministries such as World Vision. And we do this personally with uh, as we support a young child in Benin. Even giving to the offering through our church helps people without resources through the cooperative program and our gifts to the Crossroads Baptist Association, the Hope House, and Love, Inc. There are many other ways that you can give of your resources to those without, and I believe that you will feel blessed because you have been a blessing to someone who has certain basic needs. How would you rate your own desire to remember and follow God's laws as found in His Word. Then ask yourself, how tightly am I hanging on to everything material with which God has blessed me? Am I willing to let loose of it so it can be used for the betterment of God's kingdom? May God lead you to have a generous spirit as well as an overwhelming desire to do God's will day by day.